Hello, good morning everyone. Thanks for attending the morning second lecture from Dr. K. Back. And again, I'd like to take this opportunity to again thank the Storer family and their foundation for sponsoring this series and giving us the opportunity to bring in someone like Ron. And, and really, one of the things Ron has been mentioning is how much he's enjoyed our, the people he's met here on our campus and so forth. And that actually is a very encouraging thing to hear. So well, it's good for us as well. Um, to uh, hear back some, get, you know, get, get some feedback from the speakers as they get to see what's going on at UC Davis. So that's been terrific having you here. Um, this, this talk yesterday, if you weren't at yesterday's talk, you missed a wonderful talk about um, sort of the background of how the, the, the methods and the system and the, and the science of doing membrane transport science and bioenergetics. And it was really, really nice to hear a talk like that again. Um, today, it's actually going to be a little bit closer to what, um, what the, of the activities that were going on when I was working with Ron. So um, you'll get to see really, I think, <coughs> the product of a lot of work. So this, pro this, this protein is actually one of the most difficult membrane proteins you hear about. You know, uh, there's a lot of initiatives and emphasis to go and go after membrane proteins because they are the primary target for pharmaceuticals and so forth. But they also have the challenge because you have to, they're embedded in this matrix. Um, and of course, Ron chose probably the most difficult membrane protein in the world <laughs> to work on. And, and as we were in, we had several different people in the group and we were doing all different, shooting all different weapons at this lac permease. And um, all of us were saying, this is one of the <laughs> hardest proteins to work on that we'll, you'll imagine. So um, what you see is actually, a, is as impressive as it is, you have to appreciate the fact of how, how difficult this protein was to work on. And he didn't shirk away from those challenges. So. I kind of think of that, you know, there was that movie with Tom Hanks a long time ago called Castaway. Has anybody seen that? And he, he's stuck on this island and he has very few items, one of which is a volleyball. And he cuts his hand and he puts his hand, bloody handprint on it and it sort of has an image of a face in the bloody handprint. And he names it and personifies this ball as Wilson. And so all these discussions over the year, I was thinking last night, I go, well, what's Ron? He was kind of, he's kind of angry at the lac premise, but the lac premise is Ron's Wilson. And he does have this, this love-hate, but they're really destiny. The two of them are really destiny together. So I don't want to hear any more about thinking that you might have gone to a neurotransmitter transporter or something. No, it's, this was what you were destined to do. So anyways, and you'll see, you'll see that in a few minutes, I think, too. So um, with... Without any further verbiage, um, I'll welcome Ron up to the podium here. Thanks, John, again, for a nice introduction. Very cute, very funny. Okay, so I'm going to tell you today about everything you didn't want to know about lac permease, okay? Because uh, it is my baby. So the title, Dr. K Chases the Great White Permease, is obviously a play on Moby Dick, and the the obsession of Captain Ahab for getting the white whale, for those of you who don't read the literature, the real literature. Then. Okay, so I'm going to tell you all about this, and let's, let, me, let me turn this on. That would be a good idea. It is on, isn't it? No, oh, there we go. Okay, so there we go. All right, so let me start really right, right where I am. So this is the Mishnah, and for those of you who are not Jewish, it's the, the Mishnah is like a gospel, okay? So the gospel, according to Kayback, is that the most interesting and important membrane proteins are transport proteins because they transduce energy into work in the form of a concentration gradient. They are called pumps only by chumps, like Chris Miller, who don't know any better, okay? In contrast, channels are boring holes, which merely allow ions, water, urea, ammonia, etc., to flow down their activity gradients. The only interesting aspect of channels is gating, since gating is similar to transport. Receptors are obviously broken transporters that bind ligands but forgot how to transport them across the membrane. And finally, electron transfer proteins and light harvesting photosynthetic centers are just scaffolds that hold cofactors and metals in place. Okay, so there, there's where it stands right from the beginning, okay? So I've insulted everybody in the audience that doesn't work on transport proteins. That, I hope you, that woke you up anyhow. Okay, so I'm going to tell you all about dynamics and mechanism 
of my favorite protein, the lactose permease, and we're going to go from uh, the really the gene up to a structure, up to structures, I'm, I'm pleased to say. At the moment, I'm going to tell you about a structure that's not yet published that we just got a couple of months ago, but we'll save that for later. So why work on lactose permease? I tell you right from the beginning, even E. coli doesn't care about lac permease unless it's growing on lactose, okay? So this is really, it's a model system to play with. And why study it? Well, the, the reason I, I got involved with it, I didn't choose it. I got involved in this business at a time when people were still arguing about whether membranes existed, let alone membrane transport proteins. However, in 1955, when, uh, Cohn, when uh, Francois Jacob and Jacques Minot discovered the lac operon, the most probably intensively studied piece of DNA in nature, they discovered that the second gene, the lac Z gene, encoded a a, included a phenotype that allowed transport of lactose across the E. coli cell membrane. This was the first time that a gene was associated with a transport system, okay? And that meant that there must be a protein involved in this, okay? So that's why I got involved with lac permease. That's, that's the reason. Okay, so what happened with lac permease? After the lac Z gene was discovered in 1965, or 19, yeah, 65. Fox and Kennedy uh, were, were able to show that you could kill lac, perme lac permease transport with N-ethylmalayamid, and you could protect with substrate. And they managed by doing, you know, really dirty experiments to label a protein in the membrane, which they called M protein. Okay, and it, a couple of years later. I got, managed to get the membrane vesicles to transport lactose like whole cells. And of course, these things made sh clear that it was a membrane protein that was doing this, although it wasn't clear how many proteins were involved or anything else like that. It was just a phenomenon. Now, uh, in the late 1970s, Benno Mullerhill uh, cloned the lac Y gene. So it was the first gene encoding a membrane protein to be, to be sequenced. And that, of course, led to an amino acid sequence. It led to overexpression of the protein. And it allowed, um, it allowed my laboratory, uh, with David Foster being the postdoc, and Michael Newman in Tom Wilson's lab, to collaborate and purify the protein to homogeneity in a completely functional state. So one of these proteins in this freeze fracture that you saw yesterday is lac permease, one out of these zillion proteins. After purification and reconstitution into proteoliposomes, we finally, after 20 years, 1960 to 23 years to 1983, succeeded in getting the now famous ZIT model of the permease, okay? A ZIT, for those of you who are not born and raised in, in the United States, a ZIT is a pimple on your face, okay? You can see this is purified lac permease reconstituted into proteoliposomes, and that's what you see is a ZIT, a little pimple sitting on the proteoliposomes. It then took another 20 years to get to the structure, which I'm going to tell you all about. Before we got the structure, though, I should tell you a few things. So lac permease is a member of the major facilitator superfamily, which is the biggest family of membrane transport proteins that exists right now. It's, it's found in a range of organisms from archaea to mammalian brain, over 10,000 members. Many are clinically important, like the, glute, the glutes, and they, divert, they transport everything from ions up to complicated you know, peptides and, and polysaccharides. Now, before I tell you how important the protein is, let me step back a step, because I'm going to read for you a quote from the statue within, which is uh, Jacob's autobiography, and it's about what, what Minot said to Jacob upon the discovery of lac permease. What he said in my best French accent is, if we have to think about three things, like permeability, this field is hopeless, let's forget this mutant. Okay, so they were ready to forget about it. And it was forgotten about for a long time because these proteins, as John told you, are very difficult to deal with, okay? So, but before we got structure, during the time before and after John was in my lab, 
we were able to show that the protein was functionally and structurally a monomer. When you have a membrane protein that doesn't catalyze a covalent reaction, this is a very difficult thing to study, very difficult. I'm not going to go through what we did to study it, okay? I'm just going to tell it to you. Binds one, one, one mole of sugar, one sugar per mole of permease. So single binding site. It's conformationally extremely dynamic. That I'll tell you something about. It's 85% helix by CD. It turns out by, from the crystallography that you'll see, it's 86% helix. So the best method for getting the amount of helix was CD, okay? Laser Raman and Fourier transform infrared underestimated helix content significantly. Cysteine scanning mutagenesis, my favorite topic, okay? Those of you who are in this business certainly are using cysteines, okay? Your use of cysteines came out of this protein, and no study section would have ever financed this if I had been doing it on grants. No way. So what was done was first to get a lac permease where we could remove, replace the eight native cysteines with something else. So we had a cysteless protein that was functional. And then every single residue in this 417 residue protein was changed into a, into a cysteine or more conservative substitutions. For instance, if you took a tryptophan and changed it to a cysteine, you screw things up because you really changed the, the side chain. Okay, but it, out of 417 residue, it turns out that only 10, less than 10, are really knockouts. And that's what we were looking for first was knockouts. There are, of course, many more that are involved you know, to a, to a lesser extent, but knockouts are less than 10, which is here. Now, this led to, we had this, li the, the idea of doing this library of cysteine mutants wasn't just to make mutants. It wasn't just because we couldn't do anything else. It was because we had tried to crystallize the protein for a number of years by this time. It would look like it was impossible. We never were going to get any getting anything. And I had the hallucination that by having a library of cysteine mutants, and I should tell you, we made a cassette gene in which there was a, a unique restriction site every 100 base pairs, which we thought corresponded to the transmembrane domains. So we could ha have a library of cysteines, and you could pull out one cysteine from one helix, one cysteine from another helix, stick them together in the cysteless construct, and get helix packing by cross-linking. As you will see, that would have been impossible, okay? It, one side looks more or less okay, I will tell you, but we never would have gotten the structure if I did cross-linking for the rest of my life, okay? No way. So the only way to get it, well, this, this led to a model for helix packing, which is by and large wasn't really correct, so we can forget about that. So in, in, in the modern era, so in 2003, with flash bulbs, we got crystals. And you can see already from from the, the lattice that it's, highly, it's a highly helical protein. These are all transmembrane helices. The asymmetric unit was a dimer with the, the proteins in opposite orientation. Uh, and you can see already it's very helical. Now the, the actors involved in this were from my lab, Irina Smirnova and Vladimir Kasha, her husband and wife, and you're gonna see many pictures of them. And Jill Werner at the time made uh, we made uh, five or ten milligrams every couple of weeks, shipped them to Imperial College London, where Jeff Abramson, who was a postdoc at that point with So Iwata, managed to crystallize the protein and they solved the structure. And what it looks like was really dramatic, okay? Here we found was, and this is why we never get, get, you never get it by cross-linking, is here's this two six helix bundles uh, with uh, the sugar binding site at the apex of a water-filled cavity in the middle of the protein. As you can see, these helices are, are very irregular. Look at the cytoplasmic view, like helix 4 is S-shaped. I mean, there's only a couple of, uh, that are straight, and they're the ones that are probably in contact with the lipid. As I said, there's a sugar binding site, and this is not from crystallography, but the, from the biochemistry of where the binding sites where the residues are, where when you mutate them, you, you screw up binding, or at the apex of this cavity. And you immediately begin to think about, about things like what, what this is doing. Obviously, you want to say that what happens during transport, which, and again, realize this is very surprising, because here's a transport protein, and it, on the periplasmic side, the outside is tightly sealed. 
This is the last thing that you would expect from a transport protein, okay? You'd think it would be open on the outside. We're going to get to this later don't, in more detail, but again, a surprise. Uh, this was done with a mutant, cysteine, the, well, the second native cysteine to be mutated on the way to Cicillus permeates was C154G, okay? And here it says, sometimes it pays to be stupid. What that means is that at this stage of my life, we knew nothing about protein chemistry. So we were substituting the native cysteines with serine, which is okay, or glycine, which is stupid, because glycine breaks helices, okay? So this mutant was known to bind substrate, but it didn't transport. So it was put in the freezer for 10 years while we tried to crystallize the wild type. Finally, it occurred to me that maybe this thing was stuck in one conformation and it might crystallize, and that's what crystallized, okay? And the reason it works is, well, well one possible reason for, the, for, the, for the, the reason that it works this way is because when you make cysteine-154 into a glycine and you end up with the structure, you find out that helix-1 is next to helix-5, and in helix-5, helix there is a glycine at position 24. So if you put a glycine in place of this cysteine, you, you make a big empty space that allows these helices to come closer together, and probably that has something to do with what goes on. And I say that, the evidence for that is that if you change this glycine into a cysteine, you get back about 85% of the activity of the mutant, okay? The, the problem, the hooker in it is that the only thing that works is cysteine. Nothing else works. And I can't get a, an explanation for that from anybody that I've spoken to in the last 20 years, 10 years rather. That's an, 20 is an exaggeration. It, it, it's, it's an interesting problem. Okay, one of the things that I want to point out to you is that this, this is the water-filled cavity in the middle, and it's, it's really gigantic. It's very large. These are the residues that are, I'm going to talk about in some detail later as we go along. Bound phospholipids turn out to be absolutely critical for crystallization of the wild type. Okay, the, the mutant, one of the reasons the mutant crystallizes is because it probably doesn't move very much, so the phospholipid stays there. In this case, with the wild type, you need to add phospholipid, and this, these experiments were done by uh, uh, Lan Guan, who you'll see in a minute, but the nice thing about it was that the, the wild type structure superimposes on the C154G mutant structure, so we didn't create a monster with a mutant, okay? Now, Crystallography ain't all it's cracked up to be in some cases. I mean, oops, what did I do? What happened? Hello? I didn't do anything. What happened? It's still on the screen here. Yeah, something is, something's screwed up. What is happening? No. Hello? No projector what happened? Up. The last thing I needed was this to happen because we're going to go over time anyhow. Now we're really going to go over time. Well, at least it was. At least I didn't do it. Usually, like three hours or something, it times out to not overheat. Uh huh. So I'll use this moment to. Elaborate a little bit on the Wilson <laughs> analogy. So if you've seen the movie, the, remember he even had arguments with the ball. Remember that? If you've seen the movie? So he'd get mad. And so Ron would get mad at the permeates and he would come in and talk to us. And it really was. It's a, it's a, it's a love-hate relationship. It just Actually seeing the process of all this work come through um, is really remarkable <coughs> to, to stick with it. And you, it's actually, a, you know, I, I thought your point about the fact on the cysteine scanning would not being funded by a study section is really important. I mean, you actually, it was a unique circumstance, and you, you had a unique attitude to go after this thing. So it really was. It was really a fun place to be in terms of Ron's arguments with, with the Pernese itself and speak it towards it sometimes. <laughs> How can we do this? We can, maybe I can act out the rest of it? <laughs> no, I think it's, it's coming back on. I can see Oh, good. Okay. Was there specificity, Ron, in the uh, phospholipids for crystallization? No, we use E. coli phosphate. We use either synthetic 
POPG or synthetic or just E. coli phospholipids. But yeah, yeah. What stuck on there? There's about 20 moles of phospholipid per mole of protein. We, it, the, the resolution, incidentally, of the crystals that we get are, you know, the best we've ever done is 2.9. It's above at this range you can't see phospholipids. So, but if we if you take the membranes and you extract them with collate before you you extract with dodecylmaltoside, you can get rid of <coughs> uh, something like I don't know 17 out of the 20 phospholipids, and what stays there is P and P is PG. So you know whether that's specific or not, which is what you're really asking, is is I don't know. Uh, but, I mean, I, it, it would be really nice to be able to see the lipid. We really are trying very hard to get a higher resolution. But more important, as you're going to see in a few minutes, if, the, if ah, it's back. Uh, it, it, we got another structure, which I, is very exciting, which I'm, I will tell you about with all my excitement. Okay, so here's, to come back to this, the, the I was telling you that crystallography sometimes you don't get what you think you should get because it turns out that the mutant, not the wild type, but the mutant is in, in the membrane is not closed on the outside. It's, it's open on the outside when you use techniques that I'm going to talk to you about. But it, it, it's, there appears to be a difference between the structure of the mutant protein in the membrane versus the crystal structure. Not the wild type. The wild type is the same way. It starts out closed on the outside as you, you will see later. Okay, so this is Lan Guan in her Hollywood mode with her shades on, and she now has her own lab at Texas Tech Medical School and has recently crystallized another transport protein, MEL-B, uh, which is coming out in the literature soon. Okay, now, 2003, fall, a couple of months ago, okay, we get a new structure, and this is a, finally a different confirmation. It only took 10 years. Every time we did, as you'll see, other structures, we got always this inward open confirmation that you saw, okay? Finally, uh, this group of, of actors got involved in this, and you're going to see what happened in a second, but the players are Hamant Kumar, who is in Bob Stroud's lab, a postdoc in Bob Stroud's lab, uh, crystallized the protein, Janet Finer Moore actually solved the structure. The idea for what I'm going to tell you came from Irene and Vladimir, who you know, and there's this guy and Bob Stroud were cheerleaders, okay? As usual, okay? Cheerleaders. <laughs> so what the idea was is amazing. This is an idea that actually worked. Didn't work out the way we thought it would work out, but it worked, okay? And what I'm going to tell you is that in the permease, there are, on the periplasmic side, two pairs of glycine residues in, in neighboring helices. And this causes them to pack tightly and seals the, the outside. So Irene and Vladimir got this bright idea of replacing two of the, the glycines on either side of the protein with a tryptophan, as shown here. And the idea was that this was going to prevent, it was going to cause the thing to stay open on the outside. We were looking for out, open outward confirmation. And in fact, it looked, the biochemistry all looked that way. Everything we did, which you'll see all the techniques that we use to do these kind of things, uh, it said that it was open on the outside. So the structure turns out to be even more interesting. It turns out to be really fascinating. Here's Irina and Vladimir. And here's the, the asymmetric unit, which consists of two, two proteins, two molecules, that are slightly different. If you look at the sugar, you can see that there's slightly different orientation between these. And these, this is, this is the, the periplasmic side over here. They're in opposite orientations, obviously. And although you can't see it, it this is more closed than the wild type, okay? More, I'm sorry, more open than the wild type. And if you look at a periplasmic view, what you see is a protein in which the sugar is buried in, in a cavity that's a very narrow cavity, too narrow for the sugar to get in or out, okay? So it's in a, whatever you want to call this is either partially occluded or what we call is occluded 
open outside. So there's a, this narrow crevice on the outside. And what I, what, well, my interpretation of this is that when the protein is actually without sugar, it's open, okay? M much more open than this. Open enough, certainly, for the sugar to get in, okay? When the sugar gets in, the protein closes around the sugar to try to form its occluded state, but it can't close all the way, and that's why it can't transport. The, the, the cytoplasmic side, the other side, which I'm not showing you, is completely sealed, okay? So this thing will bind sugar, but it won't do anything with it, okay? And this structure is wonderful because what I didn't tell you is in the, oh, I told, I mentioned it, but in the original structure, which was supposed to have sugar in the binding site, was all based on biochemistry, not crystallography. This is crystallography, and you can, as you'll see, in the next slide is that in the next couple of slides the the sugar binding site is is clearly shown even though it's you know three and a half angstroms but before i even show you the binding site let me tell you that what i think is going on is is something called induced fit that is that when when the sugar is not there there's really no binding site and when the sugar goes in then it organizes the, the binding site around it and that's what's the energy that's used to, to put the thing into the occluded state, which then opens to either the inside or the outside, okay? So this is the beginning evidence for occluded state structurally. In, in 2011, as shown here, in a collaborative experiment with, done by Vince Chaptel, who was a French postdoc with, with Jeff Abramson, uh, we, had, we had made a compound uh, called uh, a MTS, methane thiosulfonyl galactoside. So this is galactose. Here's the, the methane thiosulfonyl group with the cysteine at position 122. Don't, we don't have to worry about positions, but you put in the cysalis background, you put a cysteine, and this compound becomes a suicide substrate. It kills the protein. It gets transported, and if, if it hits this cysteine, it kills it. Okay, so we thought we had a, we would get an open outward confirmation. Okay, well we didn't. We got an inward facing confirmation, just like you've seen before. Okay, and when you look, when we looked at it, when, when it, it shows the cysteine, the the methane thiosulfonyl part, the galactoside. Here's a tryptophan in the binding site, which you're going to see much more of, and glutamate 269 is making a bidentate hydrogen bond with the three and four positions of the galactose ring, okay? Now, in the original structure, Iwata had hallucinated a different kind of interaction between the sugar and the binding site. So I looked, it, it, this arginine was supposed to be in the position of the, the glutamate, okay? And you get brainwashed when you see that. So when I saw this, I said, oh God, this is too bad because it distorted the binding site. This, this, this crazy aberrant molecule got stuck here and distorted the binding site, and this is bullshit, okay, to use a, the term loosely, okay. So, uh, however, once you get the structure, as, you're going, as you will see, once you, once you really see the sugar, it's, this is really the making a bidentate hydrogen bond here, and it's sitting on top of a tryptophan, okay. But the arginine and the glutamate, which in the real, real structure, are, are ligands to the sugar as well as a couple of others that you're going to see, okay? They're nowhere near the sugar. So what this means really in itself is that there's probably an induced fit going on. In other words, the sugar has to be completely liganded before you get the occluded confirmation, this partially occluded thing that I just showed you, okay? Now, other, I'll, I'll show you what really goes on with this because it's really sort of neat. So here's the active site, looking from the cytoplasmic side, and I'm going to build this up as if it's induced fit. So these are two residues that are salt bridged. They have nothing to do with the mechanism. They have to do with insertion of the protein, but they're shown for fun. Okay, here's the sugar. Here's the tryptophan 151 that I already told you about. The sugar comes in, sits down by hydrophobic interaction between the bottom of the galactoparanosyl ring and the tryptophan. Okay, now, then it starts to organize the binding site. So glutamate 269, you already, I already told you about. The tryptophan I told you about, arginine 144 interacts with the thing and it's held in place by 
the arginine is held in place by, where's that glue? Well, here's, here's 269, and I, what, what came up here is asparagine 272, which is also a sugar binding ligand, and this is very nice because two weeks before we got the structure, we submitted a paper to biochemistry demonstrating biochemically that this residue is, is a sugar binding ligand. Of course, you don't know where, it's, where it is, but it, it was really nice two weeks later when we got the structure, and here's this thing sitting here, hydrogen bonded to the, I guess, the three position of the galactose ring. Okay, next. I'm going to have to go faster. So glutamate 26, which is also essential for binding, it, you must have a carboxylate there, or otherwise nothing happens is holding the arginine in a position so it can work. And then we have these very interesting residues like histidine 322 here and tyrosine 236, which is the hydrogen bonded to the histidine, holding it in place. Now, th this glutamate and that histidine and that tyrosine were postulated to be involved in proton translocation. We didn't have really any solid evidence. And what's, what was interesting was that Irina had mutated these residues and shown that when you mutate any one of these three residues, you, you really screw up binding badly. So we knew they were involved in binding, and you know you, we thought they were also involved in proton translocation. The interpretation right now is that they probably don't have anything to do with proton translocation. They're strictly involved in sugar binding, because that's what you see, OK? Let's go through the rest of this. So here's alanine, the one I told you about, alanine 122. You change this into a cysteine and then put something bulky here or change it to a tryptophan, and a very interesting thing happens. This has nothing to do with the mechanism. But if you put something bulky here, you make the permease absolutely specific for galactose. It can't take a disaccharide because there's a steric blockade that's what the circle is for, okay? Very nice, really beautiful experiment. Then we have really residues that are really involved in proton translocation. Here's arginine 302, and the one that's really important is glutamate 325, which the proton certainly leaves from, and I'll tell you about that later, okay? I'll tell you about all about this mutant later. But what happens, presumably, is that to get the proton off of here, that tyrosine moves out of the way, and this glutamate, this arginine rather, can get close to the glutamate and cause it to deprotonate. Okay, then that's going to be inherent in the mechanism I end up showing you. Flexibility. The permease is, it looks like, when you look at it, it looks like a big piece of wax with a few charges thrown around. You would not think that this thing is conformationally very dynamic. It is incidentally between, it's like 65 to 70 percent unequivocally hydrophobic side chains, which also makes you think that it's probably stuck in there in that phospholipid membrane. Well, if you do backbone hydrogen deuterium exchange, which is what you're looking at, and what you're looking at here is the, the exchange of the peptide proton, this proton, the amide proton, with solvent, okay? And what you're going to see is, let's get rid of that, is that we compared KCSA, which is the potassium channel that was crystallized ultimately by Rod McKinnon. This is before the crystallization. And LACY. Well, LACY exchanges 85% of its backbone at room temperature within maybe 10, 15 minutes. If you raise the temperature like 35 degrees, as shown by another group in Canada, real FTIR people, you get complete exchange of the backbone in 10 minutes, okay? KCSA takes three hours to exchange 45% of its backbone. So it's clear that KCSA is like a rock relative to LACY, which is like jello, okay? This means the whole backbone is accessible to water, which is amazing, okay? And I, can't, I have no explanation for this, except that the thing must be jiggling around all the time. Okay, let's go back to here. And these are the players involved in this. And I, Johannes Laputra, who was my postdoc at the time, did the, the real studies. And the reason Two Dog Miller, your old buddy, is shown here in Indian headdress is because 
A, he is part Indian. Did you know that? Did you know that he was, he was part Chakpo Indian? Did you know that? Aha, well, see, he once revealed this to me, and I'll never let him forget it, okay? So he talked Johannes into publishing this damn paper in a, in a paper dealing with the secondary structure of KCSA, okay? Just before McKinnon published it, when it became useless, okay? But this data got buried in that paper. Nobody ever sees this paper for lack of why, okay? That's why he's here, okay? A structural mechanism. Let me tell you just a few words about alternating access. So alternating access means, as Peter Mitchell postulated in 1968, that the protein moves around the substrate, allowing alternating access of binding sites to either side of the membrane. Okay? It's not that the sugar moves through the protein. It's the protein moves around the sugar. Okay? And that's shown pictorially at the bottom. Now, we have accumulated, and everybody who works on transport talks about alternating access these days, and I will put it to you that the one case in which it's virtually unequivocally alternating access is LAC Y, and it's, that, that's the reason is that we have set seven independent pieces of evidence for this. I'm going to only show you a couple of them because I don't have time to give you the whole thing, but it's really virtually incontrovertible. So the first piece of evidence was thiol cross-linking. You remember the inside is open, right? But, well, we got lots of cross-links on the inside. Cross-linking gives you the closest distance between two cysteines. So clearly, the thing must be closing on the inside in order to cross-link, right? So that was the first piece of evidence that things were going on in an alternating access manner. The second piece is about 10 years of site-directed alkylation studies. And this is when we talk about opening and closing. So we took, well, not only did we look at transport with these single cis mutants, but we looked at the reactivity of them with different malayamids, okay? And what happens on your, on your left here are all the positions where a cysteine becomes much more reactive when you give it sugar, when you give the protein sugar. Clearly, these distribute on the periplasmic side of the sugar binding site, okay? And furthermore, these residues, these positions become accessible to very water-soluble uh, malayamids. So the idea is that when you add sugar, this side opens, okay? Conversely, there's a, a series of residues which are you know, not as clean as here, but clearly distributed towards the, peri the cytoplasmic side where you get inhibition of labeling, okay? The reactivity goes down, and obviously these close, if you want to believe that from this, okay? And, and I did at the time, and we use this all the time. And when I told you that the mutant was open on the outside, what that means is without adding sugar in that mutant, these label like crazy. You don't have to add sugar. With the wild type, you don't get labeling until you add sugar. Very striking results. Okay. Further evidence came from single molecule fluorescence studies, single molecule FRETS experiments done in collaboration with Shimon Weiss's lab at UCLA. Much more quantitative data came from like 35 deer experiments, double electron electron residents, which some of you I know know a lot about, probably a lot more than I know. And these, these experiments clearly show that there's an opening and a closing of something like 15 to 17 angstroms. These are big conformational changes. They're not small. And the direct support for all of this came from really beautiful, I wish I could show you these cross-linking studies where uh, uh, Yang Gang Zhao in my lab did cross-linking with different length cross-linkers on the outside. And we could show really nicely that the outside must open and close to the extent of like 15 angstroms, the same number as we got from deer experiments, essentially. And six and seven, we got really direct support that I'm going to show you because they're really elegant studies uh, from tryptophan, tryptophan quenching, quenching studies. So these are tryptophan, as many of you, as all of you should know, is a fluorescent amino acid, a native amino acid residue that's fluorescent. But what you may not know is that its fluorescence is very sensitive to the side chains in the area, like a protonated imidazole, for instance, quenches tryptophan fluorescence. So what Irene and Vladimir did was to take the permease and put a histidine 
next to a tryptophan. Sometimes this is, this is a native histidine, actually, so they put the tryptophan here. These are both engineered in, and these are separate molecules. You don't do it in the same molecule. One set is here, and that's shown here, over here, and the other set is there, and that's over here. What you see is really incredible, okay? You add buffer, nothing happens. You add a substrate for the permease, and the, the pair on the outside shows dequenching, okay? and reaches the point where you know you saturate with the sugar these are all controls don't worry about them one of them is ph it titrates with a pk of around eight which is exactly what you expect from a histidine in a hydrophobic environment that is next to a tryptophan okay on the other side you get exactly the opposite okay you get quenching and these are controls and again it titrates at around eight okay very nice direct evidence, and you can really play with this stuff. So here's Irina. You can really play with this. Vladimir had shown earlier that if you take nitrophenyl galactoside, it's in perfect distance from the tryptophan to do fret with the nitrophenyl group. Okay. Obviously, thiodigalactoside is not fluorescent, and what you can do is the following experiment. You add nitrophenyl galactoside, there's a big inner filter effect, and light gets quenched. Now you add thiodigalactoside, which is non-fluorescent in saturating concentrations, to displace the NPG, and fret goes up. And you can make this like 90% of the signal sometimes. It's huge, okay? So we can measure, in other words, binding at the same time that we measure opening of the outside the experiment you already saw. And you can put these together and do all kinds of nifty kinetics, which is what's been done. So what this is, these are now stop flow experiments in which the data you're looking at is at the top. And what was done was to look first at the rate of sugar binding by stop flow, okay, using different concentrations of sugar, increasing. When you do this in detergent, dodecylmaltoside, the rate of binding is directly related to the concentration of sugar. In other words, it's diffusion limited. If you take the protein and you reconstitute it into proteoliposomes under conditions where it's all oriented in the right side out, periplasmic side out, and you add sugar at increasing concentrations, the rate stays constant at about 20 to 30 per second, okay? I.e., the rate limiting step for binding is opening the outside. If you take these and you add the proteoliposomes and you add detergent, it goes right back to here. That's the closed circle, okay? So the rate limiting step for binding and maybe transport is opening the outside, which makes sense, actually. I think what's going on is that this is actually just the first step. It's like priming the pump, okay? And that, that it's no, once you get into the occluded state, once, once the sugar's bound and you're in the occluded state, that's the really jiggling part of the protein that can open inside or outside, okay? Okay, here's Vladimir and Irina. Okay, mechanism of alternating access. This is, I'm giving you a very simplified form of this. In lac permease, the two six helix bundles have within each bundle three helix inverted symmetry motifs. Okay, and Lucy Forrest, has, uh, who's a modeler, came up with a really great idea for explaining how alternating access might work. And what's shown in a simp simplified form by Lan Guan are that these triangles represent a three helix bundle. This would be the N terminal half, this would be the C terminal half, and all you have to do to make the binding site, which is here, go from open to the inside to open to the outside, is to switch the conformation of the, the triple helix bundles on each side, okay? Now, this, is, of course, is modeling, and right now there's, I'll give you a little bit of evidence that indicates that this might actually be true, but I wouldn't take it, you know, hook, line, and sinker at the moment. I'm trying to figure out a way to really test this. It's not easy. I mean, cross-linking won't tell you a damn thing unless you can figure, I can't, I can't figure out how to cross-link it right. The important reason for getting into this is that there are proteins in the major facilitator superfamily 
one of them being Fuke-P, a Fucose proton symporter. And incidentally, the stoichiometry in these cases is always one proton to one sugar, okay? That's important, which I forgot to mention. This protein was crystallized by Ying Na, uh, Ning Yan in uh, Qing, Qingdao University in Beijing. She's a very good crystallographer. Her group has crystallized a number of proteins, membrane proteins. And as you can see, this one, as opposed to being open to the cytoplasm, is open to the periplasm. Now, if you take this and you invert it and superimpose it on LACY, the RMSDs are really like around one. It really looks good. It looks very good. And you can superimpose this on that or this on this. And they, so it really looks like this triple helix business might, might really be true. But again, it's, it's something that has to be really shown or tested, I should say. All right, so let's get to the mechanism. I don't know how much, how much well, we went, the, the, the computer went off, so I can continue all day. So here's what, what, we're, what we're really interested in is, is what you're looking at here. So here's the way the thing works physiologically, what you all probably know about, because I spoke about it yesterday. So you have membrane vesicles, idealized membrane vesicles or cells pumping out protons by means of either the respiratory chain or the proton ATPase working in reverse. Instead of doing ox oxidative phosphorylation, you're hydrolyzing ATP and pumping out protons, the reverse reaction. That generates an electrochemical proton gradient, which is negative inside, all these minus charges, and it's alkaline inside under certain conditions, low proton relative to big proton. The free energy released from the downhill movement of the protons with the proton electrochemical gradient that free energy is used to drive the uphill transport of lactose against the concentration gradient, okay? Now, what many of you may not know is that th these, the proton and lactose translocation are obligatorily coupled. So if you make a lactose concentration gradient in either direction, the downhill movement of the lactose releases enough energy to push protons uphill with the generation of a proton electrochemical gradient the polarity of which depends strictly on which way you push the lactose, okay? What you really don't know and is really important is that there's, a, there's a, a, a phenomenon called exchange or the reverse of a counterflow where you have either labeled or unlabeled lactose inside, cold lactose or hot lactose on the outside, and you get exchange. This is a property of the protonated permease. The proton never comes off of the permease. I'm not going to give you the evidence for that. Take my word for it. I don't want to bore you too much, okay? But what's really important is that this reaction, exchange or counterflow, is completely independent of delta mu H. You can put a membrane potential or pH gradient on top of this till hell freezes over and you don't change the rate at all. Now that means by definition, that alternating access is not driven by the proton electrochemical gradient. It's driven by sugar binding and debinding, okay? That's what drives it. And that's why I think this induced fit phenomenon is really important because it's the energy that you get from induced fit that puts it into the occluded state, and when the sugar comes off, that's what, that's what causes it to open up on the inside, okay? So this is really very important. There's a couple of other really important and blasphemic things, okay? One of them, which I think, I don't think that I skip it. The other thing, in case I skipped it, is that the KD for binding is exactly the same on right side out or inside out membrane vesicles with lac permease, with or without delta mu H, okay? So the proton electrochemical gradient is not changing the KD. So all of you guys that work on transport that have read textbooks that tell you that the driving force changes the affinity to get active transport are, okay, it, it's not true, at least for lac permease. And it's not been tested for anything else. So I, it, what, what delta mu H really does, as I'm going to tell you, is change the rate limiting step and make the cycle go round faster. It doesn't change affinity, okay? But we'll, we'll get to that. I may have forgotten, I may have done it already. Okay, so here, let me go back. Who wants to guess what the PK is for binding? Just acid or basic, what do you think? Who can I pick on? John knows already. Who can I pick on here? Eduardo, acid or basic? No 
Oh, yeah, come on, you have to guess. I'm giving you Basics. one. Basic. Uh, you hey, you cheated. <laughs> you must have cheated and read it. Okay. It turns out that the PK is 10 and a half. Okay. Now, at first, this sounds crazy. Okay. Because you would get, usually guess acid because the reaction is a proton and a, and a than a sugar, so you figure it has to be acidic. Well, it's not, and it makes perfect sense, because what it means is that at physiologic pH, i.e. from 5 to 9, which is where E. coli grows, this damn thing wants to be protonated, okay? And I'm going to tell you that protonation is the first step, without question, okay? It has to be, based on this alone, actually. Okay, so you can mess around with this PK by changing some of those residues that I showed you in the proton binding site. Like if you take the arginine, for instance, and you change it to a, to a lysine, you can depress the PK by two pH units, which is fun to play with on occasion. What's really interesting is glutamate 325, the one I told you where the proton leaves from, because you mutate glutamate 325 to anything neutral, not just alanine and you get rid of the PK, and it binds with high affinity from low pH up to pH 11, where you start killing the protein, okay? Now, for a number of years now, I have been saying that you need to protonate the protein in order to cause a conformational change that makes the binding site bind, okay? That's what I've been thinking, because that's what everybody would think. But this is the only residue that really behaves this way. You will notice that this is lousier affinity. Although you, you get the titration, it's lousy affinity. All those other residues, you can mutate them, and some of them do show this kind of behavior, but they, they're really bad affinity. So you don't know what to make out of that. This is unique, okay, really unique. And I'm going to tell you that you can make a very nice model, okay, and I hate to do this because you'll believe me, okay, there's... I can make a really nice model for you that the only residue that's really involved in proton translocation is glutamate 325. And the reason that it gets protonated is because if you have a negative charge in the binding site, it won't bind sugar. Okay? That's for sure. Okay? Whether or not glutamate 325 is the only residue that's involved, that's hard to prove, okay, or hard to really test. Anyhow, it's a possibility that it's that simple, although it seems too simple to me. All right, so kinetically, how does this thing work? Kinetics, one of the things that, that you can really do with mutants, and I'm not going to show you all the data. This is a kinetic scheme. What happens, let's start from the outside. So you bind protons first. That lets you bind sugar. Sugar binding flips the protein into an occluded state, which can go either way. Once it, once it goes to the inside, the sugar comes off first, Protons come off second, and the unloaded carrier goes back again. And this intermediate, the APO intermediate, must be a different structure than this one, okay? There's two different occluded states, okay? Now, the shaded part is exchange and counterflow. And the evidence for this is really beautiful. I'll just give you one piece, which I think you can't explain any other way, and that's the mutants in glutamate 325. All they can do is oscillate back and forth like this, okay? The mutants with the negative, with with, 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 which are permanently protonated if you put a neutral residue there, right? So they can go back and forth, but they can't lose the proton and go around this way, okay? So this has to be the ordered mechanism. It must be. It has to be protons go first and come off second, okay? It must be, all right? No way around it. There's a lot of other evidence, but I'm leaving you with that because I really believe that to be the case, and I don't, think it's, I don't think you can argue it any other way. All right, so how does this thing really work? So here's, here's the, the, the merry-go-round of what goes on, and I'm, I'm telling you down here, and I'm going to read it to you. So uphill and downhill transport are exactly the same reaction. It's a sugar and a proton. The only difference is in the rate-limiting step. So the rate-limiting step for downhill that is the lactose pushing the protons uphill, is deprotonation is the rate limiting step. And the evidence for that is that there's a kinetic isotope effect. That, is, that means when you put the things in deuterium, you inhibit the rate of, of uh, transport, okay? So there's a 
a three to fourfold D2O effect. And D2O only gives you that kind of effect when you either change the PK or you, you, uh, or you have a kinetic isotope effect. And the reason I think it's a kinetic isotope effect as opposed to changing PKs is that when you, when you stay at neutral pH and look at active, anything that involves delta mu H or, you know, or, or exchange, which doesn't involve proton movements, has no isotope effect at all. It's only when you have lactose proton symport that you see the isotope effect. The rate limiting step for uphill transport, on the other hand, is probably dissociation of sugar or possibly a conformational change that leads to opening of the periplasmic side, okay? That's, that's the difference between them. And that's, that's how I think they wor it works. So sugar binding and dissociation, not the proton electrochemical gradient or the driving force for alternating access, which I told you about. The permease has to be protonated to bind sugar. The PK is 10 and a half. Sugar binding involves induced fit which causes a transition to the occluded state, which undergoes alternating access. Sugar dissociates, releasing the energy of binding, which leads to the conformational change or, the deeper, the, or makes sugar dissociation rate limiting for transport, okay? That's how I think the thing works. Now, whether glutamate 325 is one of a number of residues involved in proton translocation or the only one I don't know, but you can make a nice story out of it being the only thing involved, and it's because it doesn't want to be negatively charged under conditions where the sugar binds. Okay, so here's Dr. K chasing great white permeates. Here I am when I graduated from Haverford College, a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed young fellow, handsome, handsome as I used to be, with red, reddish blonde hair. Now, what happened in, in later life, as you can see, progresses towards Dr. K chasing the great white whale. This is, <laughs> this is courtesy of <laughs> my postdoc who's great with, with Photoshop. Obviously, that's me, and this is Captain Ahab from the movie Moby Dick trying to harpoon the great white whale. And at that point, I leave you. Thank you very much for listening. Any questions and comments? Great. Okay. There, I laid everything on you now. Now I'm wide open, so you can you can argue whatever you like. Questions, comments, arguments. I was gonna. So when I was in your lab, the the, the um, deuterium isotope effect was an orphan seminar that you gave, if I remember. <laughs> so, I mean, how gratifying. Was this the, the first time that it, that really, you found an application for that? Well, we, you know, what we knew at the time, you know, I, I, it's funny because, you know, we, I used to, when you were in the lab, I was still thinking, I think, that the downhill transport was facilitated diffusion, okay, and that, that there wasn't, you know, a proton going, it wasn't the same reaction as uphill. But it became really clear what the meaning of the deuterium isotope effect was when we realized that downhill is, is proton simport too. I mean, they're the, same, they're the same damn reaction. They're exactly the same reaction. The only thing that's different is the rate limiting step. Apparently, I mean, I, you know, I don't know what the alternatives are. I don't know if there are alternatives. But the deuterium isotope effect, you know, I think it became very, me very meaningful. You're right, it used to be a whole seminar. Yes, ma'am. So, following John, when I was in, in your lab, <laughs> we were doing such really ancient experiments, like where is the binding site? And following Kazarovsky, uh, uh, yeah, I showed that it was uh, in the inside the membrane. So no, you also showed it was in the C terminal half of the protein. Right, right, right. Now, but Which it isn't. Now, together with 2000 S13, uh, to describe it, okay, to all of us, is floating around, and then the permeas start jiggling, okay, and, and, and then this is a an, an kind of wrapping around uh, uh, the lactose to put it inside the membrane. This is kind of uh, the picturesque picture. Well, it's more than a picturesque picture. I, I, I mean, I, I, I 
you know, I can't. I, yeah, but there, there are members of the major facilitator, related proteins that have been crystallized in the occluded state with sugar bound. So there are such structures. We don't have one. Well, the one, I almost have that structure. That's the new structure that you saw. I mean, that's almost, what, what happens with that thing is I, I really believe that it's open. You give it sugar, it closes, but it can't close all the way. And because it can't close all the way, it can't transport. It has to really seal. And I think it's, you know, I think this, you know, the controversy, if there's a controversy, is between rock or switch, which is something that does this, okay, versus something that does this, okay, and goes to always. No, no, what's, what's really very, very interesting is that the, the, the probability of opening on the outside is very low. I mean, this is like, I like to say that this is primordial taste. So what happens is the outside opens occasionally, and if there's no galactoside there, no lactose there, it, it just closes, right? And if, if, there's, if there's lactose there, then it swallows the lactose and then turns on and it goes much faster. Everything starts twirling around faster. And I think this makes sense. Okay, and it's, and it's you know, I, want to, I should publish it as primordial taste. If Dan Koshland could get away with talking about the bacterial flagellar motor as if it was, you know, a, a primordial nervous system, you could get away with calling this primordial taste. Okay. <laughs> and sell it to a study section, maybe. <laughs> there must be, come on, somebody's got to argue with me. Besides my ex postdocs well, so who know. <coughs> Obviously, the, uh, intuitively, what I was looking at, the, the delta mu H as driving maybe conformational changes, but now you have it where it's changing binding affinity. Mm -mm. That's what's really neat about this. It doesn't change binding affinity, affinity at all. But drives a release of the substrate. It, no, it's the sugar, it's, it's all that, I think that, it, look, I'm going to make a very non chemiosmotic statement, okay? Yeah, but, and that is that what, what delta mu H does is simply make the cycle go around faster. Okay, that's what it does, because it makes, the, it makes, it makes deprotonation not be rate limiting, okay? The KM changes a lot, okay? But KM and KD, as you well know, my, one of my favorite topics is to, when students start thinking that KM and KD are the same thing. They aren't. I mean, KM is a, ra is a ratio of rate constants, and KD is, a, is on and off rates. But, you know, it's, 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 really not, it's, it's really just making the cycle go around faster, okay? And, it, this is, and what, what I like to say, I, I'm glad you brought it up, because I forgot one of my favorite summation statements. The way lac permease works is it's driven thermodynamically, but controlled kinetically. How's that for a philo philosophical statement? Okay, but, yeah. So like all your arguments about kinetics, it still turns out that your first step is to protonate something. And am I correct that it's 322 is what's getting protonated? No, 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 no. 322 looks like it's a sugar ligand. I'm telling you that, look, what I'm telling you, you want me to really, look, a simplistic model is the following. Really, if you want to really be simple. Okay, the thing is filled up with water, right? Water's accessible everywhere. So do you need a pathway for protons? No. Water's there. And if we got water, you got protons. Wait, 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 just a second, just a second. Okay, so let's say that the only one that's involved, the only one that's really directly involved in proton translocation is glutamate 325. Okay, so glutamate 325, if, if it's negatively charged, you can't bind the sugar. So you protonate glutamate 325, when the, from the outside, okay, you bind the sugar, okay, the sugar goes, puts it in included state, when it opens to the inside, the sugar comes off, then the proton comes off, and that makes the thing open on the outside and get reprotonated, okay, and that's how it works, and the reason it gets reprotonated is, be, it, the reason it gets deprotonated is that the arginine, if you mutate arginine 302, which I didn't say, I should have said this, but if you mutate arginine 302, you get the same phenotype as you get from glutamate 325. That is, it does exchange and counterflow, but it won't do anything that involves net proton translocation. 
So the idea is that that, I mean, it's quite close. It's just that the, the tyrosine sits between the two of them. So you have to move the tyrosine out of the way for this to happen. I also should tell you that, you know, before we had a structure, we used to get distance information by doing eczema fluorescence, put two cysteines and pyrene and get eczema fluorescence, or two histidines and get a manganese binding site. And those experiments showed quite clearly that 302 and 325 are, you know, near each other, okay? So you can have a really simple model. I'm not saying I believe this, okay, because it is too simple, okay? But the kinetics, the order of mechanism, it can't, I, I can't see how that can't be true because you can't explain the mutants. You can't explain the 325 mutants the way they behave any other way. I mean, it's got to be that order. Protons first, with a pK of, of 10 and a half, it has to be protons first at physiologic pH. And then the sugar binds, and when it goes in, the sugar comes off first, the protons come off second, because otherwise you can't get exchange. In, in the mutants, you can't. It's impossible. So I think, I, think it, I think it fits together in a very nice mechanistic scheme. And I think, as, as is the case and has been the case, and I hate to say this, but likewise, usually 10 years ahead of the rest of the field. And then, you know, people like cysteine scanning mutagenesis. I defy you to find, I mean, everybody uses cysteines now with membrane proteins, everybody. I defy you to take the last 10 papers that are published that use cysteine mutants and find the citation to lac permease. Find, find them. They don't, you know, it's immediately forgotten where it came from. You know, and, and there's no way that anybody would have done this stuff. No way in hell. When I started this stuff, it, people were arguing that, you know, if you took a ribonuclease and, and changed anything in it, you changed the structure. And it turns out you can, you know, replace, you know, 70% of the, of the residues in lac permease with, with cysteine, you know, obviously one at a time. And it has very little effect on the, on the, on the structure, on the function, which, I mean, if you believe that, that structure and function go together, that means that it's not affecting the structure very much. You know, I mean, it, it may have some effect, but it's not a big one. But I, again, I, I think really, I, don't, I think that these proteins, in order to study them at this level, you have to be an obsessive compulsive maniac, okay? And I'm not sure that there are that many people that are nuts enough to go do all this kind of stuff. I mean, I, I, it really, I, I, it's really important because I, I think it's important. Look, I, for 40 years, literally, I tried to see whether delta mu H changes the affinity for, uh, uh, for the sugar. I, I mean, I really, we had all these theories from, from when, uh, God, from 30 years ago with dancel galactosides, where we thought we had evidence that when you had to energize the membrane, as it was called, to get in, in order to get binding of the stuff. And, uh, you know, after 40 years of schlepping around with this stuff and with getting no evidence for changes in affinity, these experiments that Lon did, which I, for some reason or other, I, that slide is, I, I must have skipped it. But the, the, we took right side out and inside out vesicles. And this you can make easily, okay? And put them on ice where there's no transport, but you can make it, on ice it's interesting. You don't have to pump any protons to make a nice membrane potential. So she took them and made membrane potentials in one case inside negative and in the inside out case inside positive. And we did without sugar, we did lactose and you, this, there's a cysteine that I didn't point out, I should have, the one that Fox and Kennedy actually saw in the first place is, cyste, is a cysteine 148. And that's a really useful residue. It's close to the binding site but doesn't make contact with the sugar. And that, it's sterically close enough so the sugar blocks the reaction of that cysteine with various malamids, okay? And that's very useful because you can get KDs up to 100 millimolar, which you can't do any other way by protection. Well, what she did was to take single cis-148 in right side out and inside out vesicles and look at binding of lactose and TDG. That's low affinity and high affinity substrates with and without delta mu H. There's no change in KD. Nothing. Okay? Now, I think what's happening is that you give it sugar, and what you're looking at is binding to the occluded complex. That's why you get the same KD from both sides of the membrane. Because as soon as you give it sugar, it goes into this orientation. 
all, all nice, reasonable explanations. You know, whether they're absolutely true or not, if somebody had a gun to my head, I'm not sure I would, you know, I would bet on them. But, you know, they're nice explanations. Yeah. Huh? Would you prefer that? Go ahead. Excellent question. Now, go ahead. Oh, it's, an, it's what's around it is a very hydrophobic region. It's all surrounded by very hydrophobic side chains. Hydrophobic doesn't push it to 10. I mean, is it dynamics? What, what is pushing a PKA to be above? I think it's sitting in, it's in, it's sitting in lipid. It's sitting in a, in a very hydrophobic environment. That's going to push the PKA up a lot. A lot? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, where's the, is your DR guy here? Oh, he had to leave. Too bad. There, 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 if I'm not mistaken, there are PKs of, of, of acidic residues in BR that are that high. Yeah, they're really, they can really get up very high. Yeah, I mean, you have, for instance, in, in these alkalophilic bacteria that make ATP with a lousy delta mu H, what's clear is that in order for them to work, they have to have in the, C sub, in the A subunit, rather, there's a, this critical glutamate that has to have a very high pK because they make oxfos at, you know, at pH 11. No, I mean, I understand the reason, I mean, the, the causality, what, I mean, what happens if you have this very high pK, and I'm just trying to see what could force a glutamate to have such a high pK. And you, you're saying hydrophobic, that means you chase away all the water. Yeah. So that's going to push yeah. the pK. That's yeah, precisely, yeah. But new molecule is very dynamic. And so what's going to happen is water is going to float around anyway. Well, it, it depends. You know, I th you, can, you can easily envisage lots of water and patches of hydrophobic regions like where the glutamate appears to be. I mean, it, it, all of these residues, incidentally, are, you know, right near the, you know, they're on the walls, either on the walls of the cavity or very close to the, to the, to the cavity. So, you know... Look, the thing is, this thing is, I'm telling you, it's 65 to 70 percent unequivocally hydrophobic side chains. It's a very hydrophobic protein. What makes it difficult to deal with is that at the same time it's, it's hydrophobic, it's also hydrophilic. It, I mean, it's, it's filled up with water. And I, you know, I, I can believe anything with this protein. It doesn't bother me that the PK is 10 at all. It really doesn't. That doesn't bother me. possible to then take, let's say, a, a glucose facilitator protein and engineer it into an active transport protein? Ah, an excellent question. That is exactly what is going on right now. We have, we, well, I'm not doing this. Uh, one of my ex-postdocs, long since you've been gone, a guy named uh, Jun, Jun Choi at, at Chicago, had just published a paper on a, a, a uh, Staphylococcus epididymis uh, glucose transporter. It's a glucose proton symporter. It has 85% homology with GLUT1, okay? And it, you know, it's got, <laughs> it's got an acidic residue there that, you know, is, is blocked by a hydrogen bond, okay? It's in the same position as glutamate 325, which incidentally is in the five or six proteins that we've looked at that have structures in the major facilitator superfamily all have something that has a glu an aspartate or a glutamate that superimposes with glutamate 325 once you start playing around. It's a story I haven't been able to tell you guys but due to time. But uh, And when you mutate them in, in the symporters, when you mutate them, they behave, they behave like glutamate 325 mutants. They do exchange but they won't do anything else. And uh, in the glucose transport, in GLUT1, there are a number of candidates, but it's not simple. That's for sure. It's not simple. But, it, it, I mean, the main problem, 
which I, is, has really been overcome relatively recently, has been an expression. How do you, I mean, if you wanted to make mutants in glued one, how are you going to express them? I mean, the first paper that I know of by a person who was crazy enough to try to express a eukaryotic protein in E. coli, a membrane protein, was yours truly. In 1989, we tried to express, express GLUT1 in E. coli for the specific purpose of doing what you're talking about. And we thought we had functional expression, but it was, it was expression but no function. The, the, the function was an artifact. <clears throat> now, you can express GLUT1 in insect cells or in, in Pichia and get milligram quantities. And Mike Muckler has done this and tr been trying to crystallize the protein. But once you can get functional expression, you can start making mutants. And, you know, you should be able to pick up one. I would think that would do proton coupled or sodium coupled, if you want, transport. And, I, and it would be relatively easy to select for such mutants. But it's yet to be done. But you, No, I don't. Well, we tried all kinds of tricks. We tried putting, you know, taking out, putting in. It, nothing really worked well. It wasn't like oscillation. It was just, we got, you know, it, we got inclusion bodies, basically. It, you know, stuff that stuck to the membrane. It looked like it was membrane protein, membrane bound, but it was, it wasn't functional. We th it, 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 at that time, when you did expression, you did it with Lambda GT11, which is a heat shock promoter, right? So we were doing heat shock in E. coli, and there was some kind of an artifact that was involved with heat shock, which I, I just don't know about. We, could never, we couldn't reproduce the first experiment. It, it worked. It, it worked fine, but then it fizzed, and it wasn't, it wasn't glycosylation. It, it was expressed. The protein was expressed. It just wasn't functional. It, it, well, it, we, we tried doing stuff. We try, well, we, if you put glycosylation sites, it could be. I mean, it's possible. It's, it's possible. It's just that, look, so far as I know, many people have tried expressing eukaryotic membrane transport proteins in E. coli, and nobody's ever done it. It doesn't yeah, work. One of the major reasons is because coli lacks the glycosylation. No, but the problem is that if you take, for instance, SGLT1, okay, which was on an earlier slide, the sodium glucose transporter from eukaryotic cells. This is Ernie Wright stuff, my, my buddy Ernie Wright. If he takes the glycosylation sites off of that protein, it's fine. It doesn't, 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 it works fine without, without, without being glycosylated. Well, you guys have a topic to start lunch with. So thank you all again for coming. Thank you.